operators have to upscale to get all the economics of scale, uh, uh, expertise in mining. And then what we did is we took the hash rate that we generated from the mining farms and we're selling it in the cloud to uh, anyone, basically. So it's a cloud mining business where everyone can kind of rent some hash rate for some time. So um, it started in 2013, so I was in there quite early. And uh, I had a pretty amazing time kind of doing everything, jumping between different topics and tasks uh, until uh, um, just last year, uh, when I actually um, moved over to a new company, Genesis Digital Assets. Yes, it's. Um, Sounds similar, it's quite similar, but we're just uh, we're focusing now more on our uh, on just mining <clears throat> without selling the hash from the cloud anymore, just because it's easier to, to scale up. So um, we're currently one of the biggest miners out there. We've got absolutely massive projects worldwide, kind of put up power capacities in places with cheap electricity, you know, build data centers, put them full of miners, and uh, you know, mine as many bitcoins as we can, basically. So that's the name of the game. We're pretty good at it. So. Anyway, that's where I'm coming from. So I thought, there we go. Um, you know, you hear about mining, but you hear about it in a context and kind of a mix together with all these other things like DeFi, NFTs, and all these kind of altcoins and tokens and ICO. There's so many topics that come together in this crypto space that when you're kind of new to the space, you hear too much at the same time and it's just overwhelming and everything kind of seems like something in the cloud. So I'm hoping to really to really uh, focus now on just the mining part for you. And the great thing about mining is that it's one of the most fundamental parts about blockchain technology. So um, to explain to you what the point of it is, why are we using so much power, what are we actually doing, what's the point of all of this, uh, the next couple of slides should hopefully show that. So I thought I'd try to take you on a, on a journey a bit, like from the from my software developer kind of side, from the from the technical understanding side, to kind of see why do we need mining? Like, what was the thought process of Satoshi when he created uh, Bitcoin, and why why did he need mining for this whole thing? So imagine you're Satoshi in 2000, or when he started, let's say 2008. Um, I mean, basically, he wants to create a money system where everyone can have accounts and can send each other coins. Right? That sounds kind of easy, but he wants it to be decentralized. So he doesn't want it to be a central bank which controls everything. So what does he do? I mean, what technology does he use to build this? So, first of all, representing numbers of who owns who and how many coins in some kind of database, this is just databases, right? This is very old technology, nothing interesting to see here. So, now, in order to be um, pseudonymous and also to be uh, decentralized, he wants everyone to be able to create their own account and not have to ask it from some entity that hands out the right to have an account. Everyone has the same rights in a decentralized system, right? Everyone's an admin, so everyone can create accounts. This is also not a new idea. This wasn't invented by Bitcoin. Um, we can actually call this the same as um, asymmetric cryptography, public-private key cryptography, where everyone can create a key pair on their computer, send out the public keys to others as a kind of identity, and keep the private key for itself in order to prove that it's actually him. So this is also not, not new, this is all technology. Um, all right, now you have a network of people that all have their own private public key pairs, their own uh, identity, and they all have databases where they save how many coins they have. It's fine, right? We can connect them up in a decentralized system. That's also not new. Decentralization is not invented by Bitcoin. So this is already a system which, for example, torrents do really well, right? Everyone can. Um, install the torrent client in their computer and download movies or stuff from other people's computers. There's no central entity needed for this. So it's not special also. And all that's needed for this is to have a decentralized um, infrastructure that everyone can use as a kind of common good. Well, that's what we use the internet for. So we've got a system where we've got people that can save their own kind of accounts with how many coins they have. They can send it between each other, update the databases, all the kinds of public private key cryptography. So what's the problem, right? Well, what's missing in the system? Right. The problem is that it's really hard to stop people spending their coins twice. Now, this sounds a bit stupid, but how do you spend your coin, coin twice you don't have it once? Well, I mean, remember, we're working with computers here, so everything's just data and you can just copy it for free. So it's really hard, so I made a diagram here, it's really hard for, hard for an evil Alice that I have here to not just send Bob one coin, and also at the same time send Carol a coin, and not tell them that actually she's doubling a coin to pay, to pay the bill. I mean, imagine this. How does Bob know that his coin is actually like duplicated and Carol also has another coin? 
How is he supposed to find out? And even if Bob has a nice connection with Carol and they talk all the time, and they don't notice that Alice did something bad, how do they find out who's actually the rightful owner of the coin, right? Is it now Bob or is it Carol? It's really like, what, 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 what do you do? So this is the problem. This is called the double spend problem. And this is the main thing that actually Bitcoin mining solves. And this is the main innovation that leads to, leads to blockchain technology. So let's think it through. What um, we need to do in order to resolve the situation, or let's say to prevent the situation actually, is we need to make sure that Alice can only send coins in order. That it's clear what coin came first and what's the second one. Right? In that case, the first time she tries to do it, everything's fine. The second time she tries to send the coin, something's not fine, right? So that at the very least, this needs to be ordered. Um, the second thing that you need to do is it needs to be public information, what transactions are being sent. Otherwise, she can just say, Bob, oh, yeah, you're the first one, and she can say to Carol, yeah, you're the first one, and there'll be no one to verify it. So we need to have a public system where Carol, uh, sorry, where Alice tells everyone, like, hey, by the way, everyone, I'm sending a transaction to Bob. And now, hey, everyone, now after that transaction, I'm sending a transaction to Carol. And that way, everyone will be able to verify that the second transaction is the bad one and will stop Alice from doing it. So, we're, we've arrived at a system where there must be a public, ordered list of transactions. This is called a ledger. So, we're at a public ledger. Now, you might have heard of that before in the context of crypto, and that's what it means. Alright, now, in order to keep a ledger, what you usually do is you have a central entity which kind of is the master of this ledger. For example, imagine that, um, I'm not sure, the technical university has a room full of like inventory, like paper and papers and whatever. And whenever someone comes and wants to take something from there, there's one guy responsible that, that notes it down, and he makes sure the ledger is correct. That's centralized. It works fine, by the way. But uh, in a peer-to-peer -peer system where we want to have decentralization, that doesn't work, right? Because there's no single point of truth. And even if everyone's acting really honestly, and doing their very best to note down the order in which they get the transactions, they might come out with different results, right? Because we're in an internet system, you know, we have pings where the network latency is inside the internet. So someone might get the information about this transaction happening like a second later than someone else. And so there might be a different ordering depending on who, where you measure from in the, in the internet. So we have a problem. We need to make sure that everyone agrees on a certain order of transactions, even though no one can actually claim that he knows the full truth, because that actually isn't the complete truth. So what do we do? We can't have a single point of truth. We, we're not, we really don't want that central entity that fixes the problem. We really don't want that. So we have to vote. We're back at democracy. Inefficient, but it works. So, um, so we can have everyone kind of vote on what they saw, and then there'll be a majority saying, oh, I saw, you know, saw the transaction to Bob first. And there'll be a minority that said, oh, but I, I saw the transaction to Carol first. So the majority just wins. Now, at some point, you have to decide, no matter if it's fair or not, you've got to decide. So you need to vote. Right. So how do you vote on the internet? Now, electronic voting, we hear about this about every four years in the US election. It's always a favorite topic of newspapers and everyone. We know that it's difficult, right? And uh, what makes it difficult? So, we've had online voting for a while, and it really doesn't work. Um, think of Instagram, where people like to buy themselves likes. Likes are kind of like votes, and yes, this is good, right? Or what about uh, buying fake subscribers to, uh, I guess, also Instagram is another good example. Right? Also, if you have, I got some uh, nice news uh, articles where 4chan actually manipulated some poll that the Time magazine did by just registering some bot accounts that has voted for whatever they wanted all the time. And actually managed to, actually there, there was an order, there was a list of, I think some kind of candidates that, that you could vote for, and Fortune, the guys built a, a bot that voted in such a way that all the 20 candidates came up in exactly the right order, so the first letters lined up and had some kind of dirty messages. <laughs> so, online voting really doesn't work, because the problem is that that an, an online identity is worth nothing. Even if you do it like with cryptography, you know, with a public-private key pair that's like super cryptographic and so on, you can generate a thousand per second on a normal computer like this. No worries. So, generating um, pseudonymous identities is for free, basically. And that means that voting is also free. It means that the number of votes that go to any person is completely irrelevant, and that doesn't help us here at all. 
This kind of attack is called a, oh, it's called an attack against this voting system. This kind of attack is called a civil attack. I actually didn't know why I think I put this, this, uh, for this, uh, for this slide. It turns out that some guy uh, wrote this book called Civil, which is about uh, this uh, lady, which was apparently called Civil, and she had a super crazy personality disorder where she was 18, was it 18 or 16? 16 separate personalities. So uh, the idea comes from this, that even though there's one real person, he may have any amount of um, pseudonymous identities um, underneath them. So we need to solve this problem now of civil attacks in order to solve the problem of the voting, in order to solve the problem of the double spend. But we're getting there, we're getting there. So the solution is proof of work. At least one solution, but it's the only solution that we know right now. So this was actually invented back in the day by uh, Adam Back. I put his website here. This is literally his website. So this is the kind of guy that we're talking about. This is his website in 2022. Um, I think he put his photo sideways, sideways so that it would fit better for the formatting and put some ways more um, white space. So that's the kind of guy that we're talking about here. Real nerd. I love it. I, I shook his hand the other day. It was a big one. Um, yeah. So basically his idea is to say, you know, if we can't vote because there's no, voting uh, is kind of free, and we can't kind of verify people's identities without having a centralized, uh, centralized control, we can at least make them pay for every vote, right? So, I mean, it's not nice because then, you know, whoever pays more wins, but, you know, at least there's a cost attached to every vote, and only people that have an interest to vote will actually vote. And the kind of interest that people have into some outcome of the vote directly influences the amount of resources that wants to get into it. So it's kind of interesting, it's kind of nice. Now, how do you make them pay though, right? You don't want to have like a you know Elon account number and like you know, transfer money here to vote. That would be very centralized again. So we really don't want that. And um, I mean we work in a payment system, so we have a unit of account in our system that we could use that to vote. That's, by the way, proof of state, but it has other problems, and uh, we, can, we can get into it later if we want. So, um, the, the main issue, by the way, is that uh, if you are voting with the value that's inside your system, and also the voting defines the value of your system, you have a kind of a circular dependency, and that has some strange implications, like the nothing at stake problem that you definitely need to, uh, that you need to get around. We, we can discuss it later if you want, but I don't think we're going to too deep into it right now. So, um, what you can do to make them pay is you can make them pay with their own computer that, they, that the voters are using. So, what we need to do is we need to find a mathematical kind of riddle, kind of a problem, that would be really, really hard for a computer to calculate the result of. But then, once the result has been found by our computer, others can very easily verify that it actually is the correct solution. So, that means, unfortunately, that things like, um, you know, um, rendering of complex graphics or like AI network generation, all this funky stuff. This doesn't work too well because to verify that it actually has been done correctly, you have to do the whole thing again. So everyone has to do all the calculation all the time. And that's a waste of resources. And if you want people to generate votes, you have a lot of computing power, costing them electricity, costing them hardware, costing them you know stuff, real stuff in the real world, basically. And then you want to be able to verify that they actually did the work, so they gained the vote. This is the idea of um, Adam Back. Yeah, he first implemented this, by the way. He first implemented this in order to combat email spam. Yes, and uh, and it's from 1997. Is it not? It's from 1997, and based on a paper from 1992. So this is also not a new idea. But um, you know, back in the day, we have all these email spam like. Or if you don't send this to 100 more people, we'll drain your bank account or something like this. Or, you know, hey, I'm the Nigerian prince and I've got $3 million and I really can get them outside of the country. Um, back in the day, there were no spam folders, so it was a real problem. So the idea was that every time you send an email, you also have to do this, uh, go through this mathematical riddle and spend your computing time to kind of verify every email to get to be able to be sent. And um, that was hash hash, he called it. Why cash? Because he wasn't thinking about money then. The idea was that you're paying for each email. But how are you paying for it? You're paying with hashes instead of cash. Uh, so that's very funny in some ways. Yeah. Well, 
get in, we'll get deeper into this. Yes, please. Sorry, just a quick question. So I see there that uh, computing a cryptographic hash is, a, is an NP-hard problem. Mm -hmm. So if at some point somebody proves that P equals NP, does it break mining or break Oh yeah, it was proved. <laughs> Actually? Yes. Oh. Sure. But um, probably they'll first hack everyone's bank account, and then they'll probably hack everyone's Bitcoin. Account. Right, there's more bigger problems. Yeah, well, like, you know, the whole banking system, NSA, they'll base their stuff on the same kind of encryption. So, if that breaks, everything breaks. And then we're really screwed, don't get me wrong, we're really screwed. I've also got a slide later on about quantum attacks, which are also great. Uh, but yeah, I mean, right now, as best we know, I mean, this kind of cryptography that it's based on has been around since the, the big 70s. It's pretty watertight. <coughs> like, there's, there's, it's kind of working. So what we're doing there is we're kind of letting people that try to practice it compete with the laws of nature forbidding them mathematically that it can't be done. Which is kind of nice. So, it's good. good defense. Yeah, it's good defense. Yeah. You take nature. Yeah. All right. All right. Um, I should um, fin finish the slide with a quick summary of where we're at now. So, we've now got a system where everyone can generate their own accounts. They've got their own, they've got their own databases where they store how many coins they have. They can send transactions to other people as they want, and there's an ordered list that everyone agrees on, on which transactions happen in which order. That sounds really good, right? That's already quite helpful. Um, all right, so we're Satoshi, and we're thinking about the state now. So we've got this kind of system of how people can send coins, there's no double spends, and all this kind of working out. So you're creating a new monetary system, right? You don't know how many users you're gonna have, you don't know how big it's gonna get. So who gets the coins? Right? Who gets the coins? And where are the coins anyway? I, I, is he gonna say, all right, I'm gonna create Bitcoin, it's gonna be capped at you know, 21 million coins, like this now, and I own them all. You can now buy them from me. Will that work? Yes, no? no. Maybe not. Maybe not. Because probably everyone will think he's a complete scam, and they'd probably be right. So it needs to find a way to, in a decentralized way, distribute coins fairly to people. Right. How do you do it? Again, we have the problem of the civil attack, right? If you have a, something like, oh, you know, every new account that registers gets one free coin to start with, or something like this. You know, one person will generate 21 million accounts in one day, the system will be done for. So you need a way, you need a way to, um, to issue the coins into circulation in a fair way, actually make sure that they actually still have value. Creating an infinite amount of coins will make their value zero. Um, so what it is kind of makes sense. Start when, Bit when Bitcoin was created, there were zero coins, not a single coin. And how did this guy to distribute them to people in as fair as possible way? He said, all right, the users of the system, the ones that actually provide the security, the ones that actually do the voting in the analogy that I'm building here, the ones that are doing the voting, that are helping the system evolve and helping it um, be secure, these are actually the kind of people that are on a reward for their hard work, and it's the miners. So the miners get the new generated coins, and the reason there's any coins generated is because if you didn't generate any coins, there'd be zero coins. So the idea is not, to, in perpetuity, give all the miners all kinds of coins, the idea is just to distribute those coins, those 21 million which exist, as fairly as possible. Another interesting mechanism that, he, uh, that Satoshi came up with was to not just literally give out the coins at, until at a certain point there's just none left and that's it, but he actually um, he came up with these halvings that happen every four years and they produce issuance of coins by half. So we're currently in the fourth period. So in the first, uh, the first four years of Bitcoin, every 10 minutes, whenever a block is found, the miner got 50 coins. Um, then after four years, was it 2013 or 2012? Um, half in 25, then 2016 was the next halving, 12.5 Bitcoin, and now we're at the, the next day for 6.25 Bitcoins per block generally. Total issuance right now is um, uh, I think around 19 million. I think we cracked the 19 million recently. So um, there's only that two more million coins to come. And because of this slowing rate of uh, new issuance, it's going to take like forever in order to, uh, to actually generate all the coins and distribute them. However, um, 
since miners are also incentivized by, not just by the new coins, but also by transaction fees, of actual transactions that they're verifying. Um, that's about 1.5% 1, 1 currently of the total value of what the miners are getting. So it's a really small amount compared to the new, newly issued coins. But if we imagine that um, that amount of transaction fees that generated kind of increased because more people are using Bitcoin and there's higher fees being paid the more people use it. And if you also account for the new generated coins being halved every four years, actually quite soon we'll be at a spot where the amount of transaction fees will account for something like half of the miners' revenue. Um, so at that point, the usage of the Bitcoin network very strongly impacts um, the, 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 the miners' revenue. Uh, maybe another, another four, four, five, six hours, I think we'll get so far, so we're talking about like 12 to 20 years or something like that. And we're already running for, uh, is it 12 years? 13 years. So it's, we're already running for quite a while, so uh, they're getting that more time, and I think the issues of new coins won't be the most, won't be the strongest economic motivator for miners to actually mine. Right. I think something else to say about this. I'll have to skip back when I remember. Alright. So basically we've managed at this point. We've made a system which is decentralized, where um, where everyone can agree in the end of a consist consistency of a public ledger of transactions that happened over time. Um, even if there are disagreements, for example, someone didn't see a transaction in time, or someone's trying to cheat, or something like this. Even when there's a disagreement, eventually you'll reach consensus just by the voting system always having to have one answer. And, um, and the most altruistic um, players in the game, which is the miners, they get rewarded with new coins. Um, we have an inflation control, but at the same time we have a fair issuance. And um, exactly, and because we have this maximum cap of about 21 million coins, which will be reached. Um, um, we um, eventually will have a system with no more inflation. So actually at that point, by definition, it becomes a deflationary system. So some coins are always left, uh, lost, right? And someone dies and gets his password or loses his ledger in the ocean or something like this. So coins are always lost, but no more coins are generated. So it's deflationary. And that makes it, at least in theory, a good store of value, right? At that point, all you need is users to actually use it and to actually attribute value to the coins to say, like, hey, this is something that's useful to me, it has utility. For example, I can you know, send them internationally, or I could, you know, I can store them in my in my own home, but I don't trust the bank to store them. So if that has utility to people, which I think it does, um, then the coins have a value. And uh, a, 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 a note of caution here. There's a lot, like I've been in this space for a while. I, I, I've been in Bitcoin since 2011, and I've, I've been in all of these, you know, price, Hypes that happened since then, and uh, it's kind of always a bit painful to see. Was that each of these hypes, there's always some new topic that kind of seems to be the new thing that's now overtaking Bitcoin, and finally it's like you know, Bitcoin 2.0 or something like this. And um, they always have great ideas, these new coins, these new projects, but unfortunately, um, they um, I, I feel that very often that these coins don't actually add significant value on top of what Bitcoin actually has. So um, let's not forget the whole innovation of this um, space is that we're working in a decentralized environment that's permissionless, where everyone can be a part of it, right? Where anyone can join, everyone's an admin. That's the idea of decentralization. Um, to have a censorship resistance, to have uh, all these wonderful properties. And um, if then on top of that you're just adding, you know, oh, I can do double the amount of transactions per second, then that's nice, it's a nice improvement. But, you know, 98% of the value is in the decentralization part. And um, some projects even go so far, actually many, that they actually sacrifice decentralization for utility. So, for example, a um, good example maybe now, is uh, Zolana, which is a, I think it's a top 10 coin up there just in the last two years. And it said, you know, we're so much better than Bitcoin, we can do 60,000 transactions per second. And they had a block for it, they had it. You can see it's, it's amazing, 60,000 per second. Now, what they don't say so loudly is that in order to run this Alama node, you need to have 256 gigabytes of RAM. And you need to have like a you know, 16 core processor, minimum, they say. 
and um, you cannot sync the blockchain because there's, um, if you will try to sync all the history of Solana, you will just not manage to sync fast enough to actually catch up with the current state of the blockchain. So what people do is they have torrents of um, you know, a dump of the blockchain database at a certain block, and they say, download the dump, and then it's like one week old, and you just have to sync one week if you do that. So at that point, we're sacrificing um, decentralization for usability. So um, that's a bit unfortunate. Any questions at that point? Yes? Yeah, uh, just to be clear about the connection of reward for mining and uh, of, is it, do, do I understand correctly, it's kind of a competitive field and if some, and it's always at the margin of profitability and if someone stops doing it, someone else will have a little bit more of a profit and that's why it's always kind of profitable or all right, it's a good question. It's a good question. I can see I'm talking to economics people here. Um, yeah, so, um, yes, if you look at the system, like the theoretical model, and you look at the miners, you know, they're earning Bitcoin, which have a value in dollars, and they have costs, right? So they have costs, most, most, most of these power costs, maybe 85% or something, maybe power costs. And then you have maybe 15% you know, personnel costs, rent, paying back the data that you build. So um, uh, eventually, the, the, the revenue that miners make and the cost that they have should converge. Because if there isn't a margin, like if mining is profitable, then more people will start mining, and that means that less people, uh, that, that everyone gets less points. Um, yeah. So so you're absolutely right. However, that's the theoretical model, and in practice, it's a bit different because you have um, external influences into the system. One of the main ones is uh, the mining, the miner production rate. So there's just a limit on how much new hash rate can be uh, added to the network, even if people want to add more. It's a situation that we're in now. Uh, then we also have factors like um, international like policy. For example, China banned all their mining last year, right? Just like overnight, oh, and weekend. They announced on Friday that people have to turn off on, on Monday. So that reduced the hash rate. So it became more profitable for everyone else. So we have these external influences, but you're right in general. So, so the, um, so you have uh, days with red numbers, do you? Sorry? As a miner, you have days with losses, I guess. Or is it a, we have losses. a days with losses because maybe there's more hash rate? In the world. Days with losses, you know. Uh, 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 <laughs> difficult, difficult. Oh, I'll answer this one. Difficult because. Um, usually don't have these springs from day to day. Now imagine that the Bitcoin price crashes down to zero for one day and then it comes back up, like something crazy. Yeah. Then sure, that one, that one day with the Bitcoin is at zero, you have a loss, but probably you wouldn't turn off because you don't see it as a, you don't see it as a development which is um, long term. So you have higher cost by turning off and back on again, then at this point you can stay on selling Bitcoin a day later. So, but if you see a long term trend, like saying, like, oh, you know, I've got more slides related to this, but oh, but, like, oh my, my, my partner isn't profitable anymore, like whatever, then you might make a decision to turn off. Yeah. So um, in our first lecture, we were like, our understanding of, of mining is that you are hashing and looking for a nonce that gives you a correct, nice hash. Yeah. Um, so that's the work. Once you find that nonce, are you just awarded all the 6.25 Bitcoin? And if you are, how do websites like NiceHash work where you just use your own computer and get a little bit of the Bitcoin? Okay, um, let me answer only one part of that question because the rest is in the coming slides. So, um, yeah, because I, I didn't, I was, I was talking about votes and decentralized voting, right? Yeah, just put this slide here. But I forgot to actually, um, uh, to actually explain what the votes actually are and what the voters actually are. So voters are any kind of entity, not single people, of course. And the votes that you send, they're actually blocks. So um, you create, you, you, you solve this mathematical riddle, you do the hash, I'll get that in the, in the next slide. And um, if, you, if you find the right solution to this problem, that means that you have found a block. And a block is a vote. So um, the idea is that if a block is found, 
it's added to the top of the blockchain. You get awarded with all the coins that you mine in this block, which is 6.25 plus some transaction fees. And then you inform everyone in the network by saying, hey, everyone that found a block, here's the validity of my, of the, here's the proof that I put work in to find the block, and everyone will accept this as an acceptable vote. And then what people will do is they'll either ignore it because they disagree with it and they vote against it, so they can find a block which will then create a fork, so there could be two, four, two blocks competing. And then, uh, or they can say, yes, this vote is fine, and they, and they start trying to find the next block. And if you, have a, if you have a situation where you have a fork in the chain and there's two competing blocks, then basically that's where the voting is interesting, right? Like, which one is the correct block? At that point, some miners will be mining on that block to find the next block on this chain, and some miners will be trying to find the block on the competing chain. And the next block that's found will make one of the chains longer than the other, and that chain wins. And the way that that works is that um, you can only put your work in to either mining on the one block or mining on the other, right? You can't choose both. You have to put your you know, put your uh, your miners where you put your money where your mouth is, basically. So you have to mine to decide on which block they mine. So there has to be a decision afterwards which chain you win. And that's why. Uh, uh, the, the, the mining mechanism is called, um, what do you call it? Eventually consistent, no, eventually convergent. It means that there can be divergence in the, in the public ledger, like in the, 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 the public ledger of truth, but it will eventually always converge back to one chain because of that voting process. Yes, please. I have a question um, in regards to the future of Bitcoin. Do you think about the functionality that fiat currency has in the current market economy in comparison to metal-based currencies? And if you also think about the power that states have in controlling currencies, mm. won't you think that states will push for their CBDCs to dominate all financial aspects of blockchain technology, such that um, what's left for blockchain to do is like functional things like uh, tracking supply chain or some Ethereum-based blockchain? And in this future, what's the like, what's the, I mean, what's the use case for, block, for, for Bitcoin, I mean? If all, of, if all financial things are done by the CBDC, and everything else is something done by some sort of smart contract, etc. So you're saying that because we have these great central banks, that we don't need Bitcoin, so what's the point? Well, no, I'm not saying that. But, but, but <laughs> well, my point is, um, gate currencies are, are dominant, and states have interest in them staying dominant, and you can see in the case of China that they are quite explicit, explicitly thinking it's dominant. Mm -hmm. So, still, this term will be used, but I mean, of course, I'm interested in just your view on this. Yeah. I'd like to push this kind of discussion to the end because otherwise we'll get out of this whole flow. Well, I'm going to give you a quick answer to this beforehand, but we can just discuss it later if you want it. I think that the value of Bitcoin comes at the point where more authoritative governments take action against people's financial freedom. So you want Bitcoin to be this kind of revolutionary kind of gray area of aspect where you can keep your coins under your pillow and no one can take them away. If you don't need that aspect of it, why even use it? But why did not use Monero, which is then actually also a private? Um, I love Monero. Okay. I love Zcash. I'm very much a believer in the privacy coins, but I think they push the ethos further. Yeah. But they make a trade-off. They trade off scalability for the privacy. Okay, perfect. Okay, otherwise they're later. later. Yes, please. Uh, what will be the um, motivation behind the, especially Bitcoin mining in the long future? I mean long future by 10 plus years. Yeah. And what is your motivation of the mining right now? Uh, sorry, what was the first part of the question? What will be the uh, um, efficiency and what will be the motivations in the Bitcoin mining, especially the Bitcoin, in 10 plus years? The mining or Bitcoin as a... Mining. 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 Yeah. Well, uh, mining is the base layer that keeps Bitcoin running, right? Without mining, you don't have a consistent blockchain. So you just, you just have a database for everyone to cheat. So the whole idea of mining is to keep Bitcoin running. Um, and that won't change. What is the motivation behind yeah. mining? Like by the miners or by mining the process? Yeah, the miners, I mean. Oh, like the companies and the Purely economic. Yeah. Purely economic. If you were, if you had miners spending their time and their resources mining blocks and putting hash rate into Bitcoin, this was a think it's a good idea. 
That would be very bad because that would mean that there's no real incentive to do it. People will be easily swayed to different sides. You want the voters to be, you want to understand the motivation of your, vote, of your voters. And if you're anyone who's trying to make money, that's the simplest thing that all you want. Even if you don't want that to work, it still ends up being the thing that So, I'd like to skip a bit forward and uh, we, can, we can have more than your questions later. Is that not the discussion already? It's great. Wait one second. Okay. Now, being who I am, I have to do a bit of a technical part. So you'll have to bear with me. This is like five slides of um, maths. So let's do it. All right. Remember that mathematical riddle that we talked about? Here we go. So, what we need to do is um, we want to make sure that miners are actually putting in work and then be able to prove later very easily that they actually did it. So we want them to so we need an entity hard problem. Uh, the, so the one that we chose for Bitcoin is um, hashing, creating cryptographic hashes. Uh, I think that in the previous lecture you had the basics of it, I'm going to skip past that a little bit, but it's an unreversible <coughs> mathematical operation. So you put in some input data, you get some scrambled output data, but if you just look at the output data, you can't unscramble it to get back to the input data. So what we're forcing the miners to do is we're forcing them to create this garbage output data, which has some strange kind of format. And because they don't know what input data they have to give in order to get that output in the exact format that we want them to, they'll just have to try again and again and again until they actually get one. And when they get one, they can send it, and you can see it matches the format easily. So that's the basic idea. Um, the cryptographic hash. Possibilities for every letter, right? 
That means that every 16th hash would have a leading zero in fact. That's a 1 in 16. So if we have a requirement for two leading zeros, then it would be every 16 times 16. Uh, what's that? 250 or something like that? 256? So then if one in 256 hashes would be uh, matching. And so with every leading zero, it gets diff more difficult by a factor of 16. Um, so that's why it quite quickly gets really difficult with uh, ex exponential uh, difficulty increase. Now, in order to, so in general, if you want to calculate how many hashes do I need to reach this, this difficulty limit target, then you calculate 2 to the power of 32 times difficulty. This just works out that way. Um, so if we look at the current difficulty, which you can check in every block explorer, it always shows you the difficulty, it's like a big number up there, this kind of Then um, at the moment, that would be this number. That's the amount of hashes that we currently need in order to, on average, find a block. If we convert, if we divide that by, so if we change the format into extra hashes, this is reduced from zero to seven extra as one to the power of 18, that means that we need 1.28 times 10 to the 5 extra hashes, so about 12,000 uh, uh, extra hashes. And since we know that we want to find a block about every 600 seconds, we know that that's the usual block rate, so we can divide that number of hashes needed by 600, and we get 213 extra hashes per second. So this means if we have a hash rate of 213 extra hashes, like random tries, performed per second, then in average, every 10 minutes, we'll find a block. And that's exactly why this bound of difficulty is chosen. So this shows us the current um, network hash rate that all miners in the network probably have, in average. By the way, that was easier to explain when I was writing this slide. It's hard to actually explain it in person. Note to self. Alright. Now, you can imagine if more people join the network and more miners actually start hashing, that means that there's more hashes per second being tried. So that means that on average, blocks will be found faster. Which is nice, right? More people joining, more finding blocks, more coins being issued, everyone's happy. But remember, we don't want this. We want to have a stable inflation, and we want to have a stable uh, timeline where we get one block every 10 minutes. So we need to readjust the difficulty, usually make it higher, make it more difficult, when more miners are joining the network, so that in average we get back to the one block every 10 minutes uh, time. So what we do is every 2016 blocks, which is about every two weeks, or 13 and a half days, we kind of look at the previous period of the last two weeks. We look at um, how many blocks were found. Uh, sorry, we look at um, what was the average time between the blocks in this period. And if it's less than 10 minutes, then we increase the difficulty. And if, it's, um, if it took more than 10 minutes to generate the blocks, it means that the miners were having too much of a hard time to solve the riddle, then we uh, reduce the difficulty. So every two weeks, there's a difficulty adjustment, it's called, which uh, adjusts the difficulty back to the expected value of one block every 10 minutes. Uh, that's right. And by the way, since usually, the, the, since usually a Bitcoin hash rate is rising because of the newer hardware, price increases, more people turning on and stuff. Usually hash rate is going up, but the difficulties only change retroactively depending on what happened in the last two weeks. So usually block times are slightly below 10 minutes because of that. Because within those two weeks, more miners are again adding their hash rate and blocks have come faster again than 10 minutes. Yes, please. Good sites. Um, that just means other, other of the difficulty. Is it like the general consensus or like where does this adjustment come from? Good question. Of course it's decentralized, otherwise what's the point? Mm -hmm. So it means that everyone, every node in the network does this. And if someone were to disagree, for example someone changed the code or something, then you'd be thrown out of the network for being different. So this is just the formula that's in the code. Look at the last 2016 blocks, Look at the average time in between, adjust the difficulty by the ratio to 10 minutes. And if someone doesn't do it and it starts generating blocks that have the wrong difficulty, they'll just be rejected by the rest of the network. So just say no. Okay. So this is a consensus critical uh, calculation. Same question. Same question. Good. Yes, please. What if all the computing power is done by the 
Sorry? What, what if I'll make the people like a harsh portion of the computing powers owned just by a few uh, companies like a mining company? Very good question. Very good question. So um, if uh, it's a voting mechanism, right? So if someone can collude with other people to create more than 50% of all the blocks, so it means that the next block has a higher than 50% probability of being controlled by that party, then they can, in theory, um, um, could win against others that are voting honestly, and they can do a 51% attack against the network. This is bad, we don't want this. Um, uh, and it has happened before, so this is a good thing, otherwise it would be just theoretical. Um, the, the Chinese miners actually colluded back in 2016 and tried to attack Bitcoin and make it a different, um, make it a different software, make it a different product. And they had more than 50%, they had like 60 or 70% of the hash rate. So what, I, what, what actually happened is that the regular community, not the miners, but the regular community like exchanges, developers, wallet um, developers and stuff like this, they, uh, they, they boycotted this and they said like, hey guys, like if, if you miners are going to do a 51% attack against Bitcoin and change what Bitcoin is, we're going to change the mining algorithm of our phone to make it different. Oh, sorry, not, not change the mining algorithm, but we're, we're going to like half burden our systems to not take this route, and we're going to stay with how we think Bitcoin should evolve on our own terms without you guys. And it led to a huge trouble for like two years of like huge debate and bullshit and badness going back and forth. And the users won. The Chinese lost. What that be a fork? <laughs> sorry. What does that be a fork? That was a fork, and it is fork. It's called Bitcoin Cash. Uh, Bitcoin Cash is a coin which was forked by them, and, and they called it the real Bitcoin. They said, this is the real one, and everyone said, no, this is not the real one. And then there was the big discussion, which one is the real one, right? And um, they could have lost, they renamed it to Bitcoin Cash, um, and it's, uh, you can see the markets playing it out, like where the people see the most value, and Bitcoin Cash is going more and more to zero, while Bitcoin is unaffected by Bitcoin Cash. But that was a big topic back then, when it launched, there was a big disagreement because people were saying, you know, if they have more hash rate, then they are the real Bitcoin. And other people were saying, no, but they, they don't follow the philosophy and the design principles that build Bitcoin now, so it's not the real Bitcoin. And uh, I think it started being worth like a seventh or one eighth, eighth of Bitcoin. So you could pay 10 Bitcoin cash for one Bitcoin. But it's kind of crashed since then, and it's, it's clear now. All right, I'll continue. Yes, more attacks, quantum attacks. So this always comes up, so I have to put it in there. Um, we all know that quantum computers have, are amazing and they might revolutionize everything. What do they actually do? Quantum computers can do two things that we really care about. The one thing is they can do Shor's algorithm, invented by a guy called Shor. Um, what this can do is it can factor large numbers. So you know, give it a big number and it can tell you, oh, this is the multiple of this and this number. You know, like 15 times. Like this. I think that's the biggest example of what a quantum computer can currently do. It can factor 15 into 3 and 5. So that's where we're at with quantum computers. Um, but they can do it really well. So this is a bit scary because all asymmetric cryptography, the public and private keys that I was talking about, they rely on this kind of calculation. So basically the private key that you have in a key pair is like a sum of two absolutely massive numbers. And not the sum, sorry, but the product of two absolutely massive numbers. And if you were able to kind of find out how to factor them into the two numbers again, um, your private key would be compromised. That's very bad. So this will definitely break um, public key cryptography once the quantum computers get that far. So, for example, to break 256-bit uh, um, 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 uh, private public key pair, which is kind of a standard thing to use, 256-bit encryption. Um, if you wanted to just try it out on your computer, to try it randomly one by one, you need 2 to the power of 256 tries to get it, which is really a lot. Really, like that's like more than the number of atoms in the universe or something crazy like that. So you can't find it, and that's why it works. But a quantum computer can actually do it uh, in log of that number. So it can do it in 256 operations, which is scary. But that's really easy, right? But you first need to quantum computer with 256 qubits, and they currently, I think, can do four or 
so I'm not sure. So uh, anyway, so Shor's algorithm is scary against public private key cryptography, and we should definitely um, uh, continue checking this problem, which is how far they get. The other thing they can do is they've got Rover's algorithm. Rover's algorithm is something that can crack hashes, to make it more simple. So um, if you have a hash, and we know Bitcoin uses SHA-256, which is a 256-bit hash algorithm, um, if you want to try it randomly again, you have to do two to the power of 256 um, tries to find it randomly, and that's never going to happen. That's why hashes are safe. But if one computer could do it in the square root of n, so it could do it in two to the power of 128 operations, which is less, but it's still two to the power of, two, uh, of 128, which is still absolutely massive. So there's no real problem with quantum computers cracking hashes. So the hashes are safe, the private and public keys are not safe. But in order to understand the safety for Bitcoin, we have to understand the safety for what's actually happening. Um, the mining algorithm that finds the new blocks, this is only based on hashes, right? And like I said, hashes are safe. So a bit, the quantum computer can't just trade a million blocks and get all the Bitcoin. That, that won't happen. So we're safe against that. But uh, if you have sent transactions on the blockchain and you've used the private key, to encrypt those transactions and to verify that it's really you doing it, then you've exposed your private key to the blockchain, and uh, then it may be vulnerable to a quantum attack. So you only expose your private key to the blockchain when you spend coins. Actually, if someone sends you coins, then you don't expose your you don't expose your key to them. You only give them your address, which is a hash, and that's why it's safe. But once if, let's say someone sends you one Bitcoin, that Bitcoin is sent. If you take half that Bitcoin and send it somewhere else, that transaction of sending that has now compromised your private key, and now your half Bitcoin, which is left at the address that you have, that's now um, attackable by a quantum computer. So, um, it's a bit nitty-gritty, like details for what you're allowed to do and what not, so um, you can't expect users to understand that. So definitely this is something that um, the, the Bitcoin developers are, are looking at, making future and developers more quantum proof and so on. But for now, uh, everything's kind of still fine, while quantum computers are still so weak. But just remember, don't reuse Bitcoin addresses, you're going to have a bad time. Right? There's even a chart here, a cool chart, how many Bitcoins are actually vulnerable to quantum attacks. Like how many Bitcoins are in addresses that have been reused. So you can see that red dotted line, so about 4 million coins, most of those being um, Satoshi's coins that he mined and then never touched. So, anyway. Just a quick question, how does that graph go down? How does it become safe again? Um, and by people um, taking their coins away from unsafe addresses and putting them in fresh addresses. Oh. Yeah. Right. But how are we doing in time? How much do we have? Are we almost done? <laughs> There's a QA period after. Well, I've got, yeah. I've got a bunch to go, so uh, let, let's see. I can go faster. Let's see. Uh, okay, mining pool. There was a question earlier about how to actually, how the miners actually uh, connect to the, how the miners actually connect to the, um, to, to the nodes and how so many miners can mine the, can mine the blocks. Basically, the problem is if you have this one mine, let's say an SIG Pro mine, You'll actually just have zero point zero point zero 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 five percent of the network. So basically, you'll almost never find a block. You'll find a block every thirty-eight years. Effectively. So that's not very consistent income. In order to increase the uh, consistency of your income, you want to pool your hash rate together with other people, and then together find a block and then distribute those coins between everyone that helped find it. And um, that's what mining pools were invented to do. Um, the problem with mining pools, though, is that they're centralized. So we're trusting that mining pool to really distribute the coins fairly without that they find the block. But that's another topic for itself. I'll skip past it. Right. Now it gets interesting. Um, what hardware do people use to uh, to mine Bitcoin? Back in the day it was a CPU, right? You just mine Bitcoin with a computer in 2009, 2010. Um, very quickly though, that didn't um, that wasn't the thing anymore. People wrote the algorithms to compute hashes on their GPU instead, which is much more efficient. Imagine that you know, your display has like a million pixels, 
and they refresh every 60 seconds. So you've got a piece of hardware in your computer that can generate you know, a million times 60 maths operations per second and more than that. That's much faster than a CPU can do. So mining moved to GPUs. And still GPUs are used for mining quite a lot, but not for Bitcoin anymore. For example, mining Ethereum is on, on, the, on GPUs and other things. We see here a logarithmic graph of the hash rate increase of Bitcoin over time. Um, you can see it's very steep in the beginning. That's for the transition from CPU to GPU, and then some FPGAs in there too. And don't worry about this too much. And there was kind of a flattening off period. That's because it kind of reached this um, the market equality where it just wasn't worth it to install more mining hardware. And then the price increase came again, and also ASICs were invented. Now, what are ASICs? ASICs are um, custom chips built only for mining Bitcoin. So uh, you can, uh, you can um, squeeze out a lot more efficiency from an ASIC than you can from a GPU or a CPU. This one is like specialized for only doing the one thing. Uh, I've got here an evolution of the, uh, the energy efficiency of the ASICs over time. You can see that um, efficiency can have decreased very steeply in the first years of ASICs, and then since then it's leveled off a bit. That's because the evolution of Bitcoin ASICs started more like on the, on the logic front, uh, and like and trying to catch up with the industry basically, that's why improvements were so big. But now we've reached that uh, Bitcoin ASICs are using the same process technology that your newest CPUs and your newest GPUs are using. So the efficiency limit uh, of an ASIC is now more defined by the process technology that it uses, and that just kind of slow rate of progression nowadays. Okay, about decentralization. Um, this is a map where you can see in red dots, these are all the Bitcoin full nodes. And um, you can see, like, this circle, the areas where Bitcoin might be used. So, um, it's pretty obvious to see Bitcoin mining is not where the full nodes are. And I think this is interesting, because when we're talking about decentralization, we're talking about distributing the, let's say, voting rights, or the, the, the points of power as much as possible. And if we assume that the, that the Bitcoin nodes that those are more like exchange operators, wallet providers, IT infrastructure providers, and stuff like this, which definitely have some kind of voting power, right? As we saw with the Bitcoin Cash fiasco. And if you see the miners in those other areas, and this is where like the, the mining is, then you can see that it's actually acting as a kind of a counterbalance to all the populated areas where all the where all the other, other functions for Bitcoin are kind of centralized a little bit. Um, here's a graph showing the total hash rate in the Bitcoin network and uh, the types of machines that are making it up. At least it's an estimation, no one really knows exactly. So you can basically see red is the one manufacturer, blue is the other manufacturer, and then green in the middle is another manufacturer. Uh, just to be fast about this, a lot is on this blue side, right? That's Bitmain. Um, Bitmain is the biggest producer of miners, and it's a huge risk for centralization, right? If all the machines come from the same person, then you know, that person put up control of the network. So I'm really looking forward to um, developments that will diversify that more. For example, Intel is now in the mining market, and are producing chips and selling the uh, Bitcoin mining chips <coughs> in the US based. We've got a lot more startups in the US, and also since China is now has banned Bitcoin, um, there's a lot more room for uh, for uh, startups in other places to come up and diversify the landscape. Um, like I said, mining pools are also kind of centralized, or a centralizing point. Like you can see here on the left side, that's the diagram of the different hash rate that different pools have. You can see here that four mining pools have more than 50% of the hash rate. That's kind of bad. Um, of course, miners can choose to switch to a different pool if they disagree with that pool's policies. Right? So if foundry gets too big, mining will just switch to a different one. Uh, and keep it decentralized that way. But it's not great. There's a wonderful approach, which I don't have the time to go into, to um, decentralize the pool landscape. For example, by letting miners um, mine to a pool and get those benefits from, um, from having a stable income from a mining pool, but at the same time to build their own block templates, which is to choose their own transactions which do not include the blocks. That gives the decentralization aspect and the consistency aspect. Okay, I hope that this works. I actually uh, I put together some. Does that work? Put together the some. Uh, yeah, I can actually put some. 
some, some of the evolution of how mining farms have changed over the time. So I spent a lot of time in mining farms and I enjoyed my time a lot. And um, you know, it's the this video that I have here at the place. Um, I found this randomly, this is not me, I found this randomly on the internet from some guy in Bulgaria. And it really kind of captures the kind of idea where Bitcoin comes from back in the day. Like it really captures this, uh, you know, against the machine kind of uh, aspect. Let's see if this works. I didn't put the sound on this. Like that. Oh. <laughs> and this is the guy showing off his mining farm, you know, against the machine. He's got his own fan up there, which is going to control the temperature. See here, that's a bad flow management approach. It's going to cool the underneath this down there also. Yeah, of course, RGB, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, as well, I sort of learned from my basement, by the way. They are very interesting stuff. Uh, and it uh, turns out the music, he didn't edit that, but who knows, do you make it like it looks like? You know, the music is actually. <laughs> so, and this is also part of that, I suppose. And uh, that's his cooling solution. There we go. Karl Marx looking after everyone. And uh, that's the subwoofer, which is part of the build. Uh, isn't that awesome? And then, uh, yeah, this is just kind of it. Yeah, the whole enzyme, and it's a power you know, with the sour, very good. So, that's what I was awesome. Now, of course, they not. Uh, how should we do it from the time? Should we uh, make it optional to stay, or uh, can we send around the slides, or do we have to make it hard stuff? Well, I mean, uh, maybe you have another 10, 15 minutes, and then we just want to quickly go through these slides. And yeah. then, we, like, afterwards, everyone can leave. Well, like, well, it's, uh, you are always free to leave, but I would suggest, like, run another 10, 15 minutes for breakfast. I think we can do it in about 10 minutes. It's a great, great topic. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, so I'll just carry on. I think I can finish in about 10 minutes. I think we can do that. Ah, Again. I know it's just the next time we go. Alright, so the first stage of mining farms is home mining. So this is how it all started, right? Nerds finding the Bitcoin software on the internet, downloading it, running it, and seeing, like, hey, I want to generate some coins, this is fun. So uh, we see some builds that are at home. Um, you can see most of these are actually, this is a GPU build, so you have GPUs here in the slot, um, all this over the motherboard, you can see with some distance between some air, so the air can circulate a little bit. Um, this is another GPU build, Put a bit more GPU so we space them out a bit more to give them a little more space for all the heat. Um, this is actually a farm of USB miners. So USB sticks that you plug in, they take two apps from the USB port, cause definitely, definitely cause fire hazards. And if you put so many in one room, you've got all kinds of problems. This one looks so beautiful on the USB ports, you can see. This one here is actually the first mining farm of Genesis Mining. Um, same thing, also USB miners that were called grid seeds. And they did a couple of bigger hash back in the day. This was great. So this is what home mining looks like. Note that it's a huge mess. And note that um, most of the design is focused on trying to keep them cold somehow. Because there's no proper airflow here. There's definitely no data center environment. Um, it's a huge fire hazard. And everyone is trying to keep it stable somehow. So that's home mining. Works great, by the way. No problem with it. Just it has its limitations. And the limitations become more obvious when you have home miners building mining farms. So um, this is what that looks like. I'll call it garage mining. So this is like a garage, and you go to you go one of those red power plugs, and now you can finally like mine large scale. And you learn it always in your living room, right? So what could possibly go wrong? I'll tell you what goes wrong. Um, the problem is heat. It will overheat. So you can see here, this is actually our second mining farm that we built in Iceland. Um, you can see there's lots of space, it looks like really airy and really fresh. You got things actually stripped 
basic minus mining life point if you have some CPUs. And then this over here is like crazy. Where the garage door open and where the where the camera is from, this is where the uptake fans are. So we have a great idea that the airflow would come through the building. I guess that worked, but it, it actually didn't work. So there's only 400 kilowatts in a building like this. Like if you did this properly, this building could definitely hold um, four or five megawatts. So factor 10 was because of bad cooling. Um, this is actually one of the first that I built also. Uh, that over here is like crazy. But I, 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 <laughs> the problem was also the intake where the air comes in is here on the side. You can't see it from it's like cut open from the side. And the guy that we were working with for the facility, he promised me to put fans up here on the roof. So we get a nice airflow like this through and at least like some kind of he didn't keep his promise, he put the uptake fans above the intake. So the air got sucked in here, everything got heated here, and it got sucked straight back up here. So what you don't see in this picture, because I was taking very carefully, there's pipes going between the shelves, trying to pipe the cold air to the back somehow. It's really bad. It's really bad. And this is actually a PNC minus facility. This is a 20 megawatt facility. This is serious. And it's just over here that crazy. So this is the problem that you get when you try to scale up without any good professional approach. Alright, now a proper approach. This is how you do it. So this is actually this approach from our funds. <laughs> so uh, what you do is you have the air intake on one side, in this case it's uh, down here. And imagine this being like a big tube. And you pull the air through, you can see in the diagram, here comes the air. You pull the cold air through the tube all the way down, and then you have the cold air going to the minus, the minus blow it out, and then all the hot air collects in the open space that you see here, and it's kind of brought out the roof or something like this. So what you need to do is you need to establish a hot cold out separation where air doesn't just circulate randomly, but it has a very clear direction how the air has to go. And that way you can cool with outside air, but at the same time um, have a lot of power density in your house. Oh, by the way, this is actually the same farm as the KNC farm before. We bought the facility, but they were bankrupt, and we looked at this. <laughs> yes? Yeah, that must be like a lot of, lot of heat. So, would yeah. it make sense to use like thermal turbines when you have like a circular electricity economy? I don't know how much like energy you get out of this, but is that a thought? Is I that mean, a thing? Well, I mean, I love the idea of reusing power to have a perpetual mobile machine that always like powers itself, but there's practical issues with that. Like really, like, you can't do it. It's like physics. Yes, it would never be spectacular, but no, it's no. Too you, can, you, can the, you can use that. You can use the heat that comes out of these things and use it productively. For example, people dry fruit. Uh, they grow weed. What a joke. Okay, um, <laughs> that's America, of course. Uh, they, um, we've actually got a project up in Sweden where we've blown the hot air into a greenhouse and they're growing tomatoes. And um, <laughs> there's a great idea for how to kind of make this work. But the problem is, like, for example, this facility is 40 megawatts. No one needs 40 megawatts of hot air, that's a lot. So um, um, we still have to see how the mining industry can grow together with other industries, other industries that need heat to kind of um, have a use for that waste heat. Otherwise, it's just hot air. Let me get through it, because we're way over time already. Okay, and then the next stage, if you don't want to do um, hangar type buildings, but you can actually go one step further and build your own buildings, then you can do even more optimizations on the design of the mine. So, um, all of these are examples for custom built buildings. Um, this is currently the biggest um, very public mine that they do a lot of marketing. This is actually a right blockchain built in Texas. You can see that long, thin buildings. So they have really big and airy take on the side. And the air just goes through the miners and out the roof. No big complicated pass through the data center, just in through the miners out. Um, here is a facility that we built in uh, Iceland. You can take some similar idea of a long thin building where the air gets sucked out the top by big mining fans. Um, here we have examples of containers, these three. So the idea of a container format is that we have these 40 foot shipping containers. They've got a standardized form factor which can be shipped all over the world on trucks and trains and boats. So why not use that and put the miners inside that? And that's been an ongoing topic for the last couple of years to kind of optimize containerized builds. So um, obviously it's nice to have a centralized production of containers, you know, 
build, build you know, ten a week, and it's shift them to the location, middle of nowhere, someone who's taking to the power, that's it. That's great benefits. Okay, and then the up and coming stage that um, everyone's talking about, but not too many people are actually doing, is uh, immersion cooling. So the idea is to take a bunch of mineral oil, or any kind of other dielectric fluid, and just put your miners inside the oil. Uh, this is fine, it works great, uh, but you then have to deal with the hot oil, because the oil will heat up. So you need to have the oil pumped through pipes, and going to heat exchangers. You can see in the diagram. The oil comes out from miners, and as up here, it comes to the dry coolers, and it comes back. You need pumps, you need filtration system, and it drops in the tank, and it's contaminated. And it, it gets messy, but um, the, the benefit is that you have much higher cooling um, capacity. So the air is actually really bad at taking away heat, so there's a really bad heat coefficient, and uh, these kind of oils are like a factor, you know, 20, a factor 50 better than air. So they will actually cool the machines much better, allowing you to overclock them, for example, or to run them in horrible conditions like in the desert or a sandy or a salty environment. This is the current biggest facility of immersion that's very known. You can see that the cooling towers outside the building. At the mines are inside, and there's almost no ventilation inside because all of the heat comes through the oil. Alright, uh, I've summarized what I just said here in the table. I'm going to read the whole thing again. But basically, the interesting thing to, to, to point out is that home mining is actually pretty good. You know, you don't have heat problems so much, you, you don't have scale problems, you have zero cost because you have the home anyway. But it's all pretty great, it just doesn't scale. And, uh, but then, as soon as you try to go any bigger than that, you have huge problems. And only by uh, scaling up and having like, really efficiencies of scale, that then allows you to um, bridge those problems again. And if you actually manage to bridge all those problems and you have a custom build, uh, custom buildings, you have lots of megawatts for that, then you're back in the good territory, um, similar to home mining. So I think this is interesting for the decentralization aspect, because it means that um, home miners can compete with industrial miners, just in slower, um, smaller form. Um, yeah, interesting point also is about um, comparing mining farms to data centers. So I'll show you the evolution of mining farms. So they've gotten more and more professional and more and more worked out and better looking also. Um, but they're still not, still not data centers. Um, there's different data centers tier, tier 1, 2, 3, 4, tier 1 being the cheapest data center. And even if you compare tier 1 data centers to mining farms, there's some disconnect between that will probably never be bridged. So I don't think that the mining and the data center industry are going to merge and become the same. I think they're separate. Uh, the main difference is that um, data centers have um, backup power, and mining farms don't have backup power. The reason is quite simple. If you're running a data center, then you're usually renting out machines to customers. The machines will run in a row and use their machines for like whatever, maybe rendering with the AI or whatever. And these are usually very long-running calculations, like some rendering might take a day to complete. If you have a five minute power outage, the whole calculation will be ruined at the start again. So a five minute power outage in a real data center will have, um, for normal IT workload, will have catastrophic impact to the customers. Uh, but for mining, if you have a five minute downtime for mining, you just lose five minutes of month. You don't lose, there's nothing else that you lose. So a mining plants can deal with a lot more instability. So I think this is the gap that would be bridged so easily. Okay, power use. This is the last part that I'm uh, talking about. So, but it's also one of the most important because uh, Bitcoin is in the newest everywhere for using a lot of power and for you know, wasting a lot of resources and for costing the environment a lot. And these are fair points and uh, let's discuss them. So, how much power are we actually using? In order to calculate that, we have to take the hash rate, which we kind of know, the difficulty, and we have to estimate how much power is needed to create that hash rate. Um, that's difficult because every type of machine has a different kind of efficiency, like how much power it needs to create, like, let's say, one terahash of hash rate. So we have to estimate what's the hardware mix currently that I'm running. Uh, luckily, there's some very smart people that have done a lot of numbers and they came up with this graph. So we can assume right now that we're using about oh, um, that we're using about 57 watts per terahash. So we can use that number, and by just multiplying that number with the current hash rate. Um, we can estimate, quite simple, that power use is around 12.1 gigawatts. Um, people like to say that's about as big as, about as much as a small country. Yes, it's about as much electricity as the Netherlands use. Oh, let's make sure it's 
the same amount of electricity as the net Netherlands uses. If you look at the total power use, that includes natural gas, ovens, cars, and so on, then we're like a tenth of what the Netherlands uses. So there's an important difference. Not energy, electricity. So that's about one, zero point, about zero point two percent of total power use is going to Bitcoin. Um, Okay, I won't spend as much time on the slide as I anticipated because we're already so much out of time. But basically, it's a calculation that um, helps to estimate what would the power use of Bitcoin be if we were at this equilibrium standpoint uh, where uh, miners are earning about as much money as they're paying. Because right now, mining is super profitable and everyone's buying more mines and putting them up. So, power usage is going up, right? So, where, how far will it go? And um, basically, it would go to about uh, where did I put it? So it could grow about plus 150 times, so more than double. So which would add another 18 gigawatts for a total of 30 gigawatts of power. That was where we would kind of reach equilibrium. However, until we reach that, until we create so many machines, the next halving will hit, which is 2024. And at that point, revenue halves, right? Because half the amount of influence are generated. So, after the halving, uh, revenue is half, so the cost can also only be half to reach the equilibrium. So we're about 15 gigawatts would be the equilibrium, which is actually reachable. So we're at 12 now, we can estimate to reach 15. If the price doubles again, then that also doubles. That's clear. If it halves, that also halves. So how much CO2 impact does Bitcoin mine? This is the big question, right? So the graph that we have here shows the estimated um, uh, source of electricity for, for Bitcoin mining. The, um, the, the grain is coal, about 35% of Bitcoin is created with the coal. Um, about 25% natural gas, and we've got some hydro, we've got some nuclear, and then we've got some solar and wind and other small stuff. By the way, wind is getting much bigger now because miners are deploying in Texas, and Texas is full of wind, so this is um, expected to be bigger. But anyway, if we look at the average CO2 emissions for generating these kinds of powers, and we take it um, at the latest average, then this is about the CO2 efficiency of uh, Bitcoin, and if we plug that into the 12.1 uh, gigawatts, then we get about 44 megatons of CO2 emitted per year. That's about 0.1% of all emissions globally, so about 1,000 of the world's CO2 emissions. So, how is that going to evolve over time? I think there's a misconception where there's a uh, where people are assuming in order to use green power, in order to use, in order to use renewables, you have to invest some more money. You have to spend some money to kind of, um, get the green power and to pay more. And Bitcoin miners always want to save money, so they always go for the cheap dirty power. Um, this is actually not true. It's true for you guys at home because here in Germany. We have to pay extra to get green power. But if we look at actually new energy projects being realized, like infrastructure projects, um, renewables are the cheapest source of power. Um, and this is actually quite, quite a strong point. Hydropower is, costs about um, one cent per kilowatt hour to produce. Uh, wind about two, something like that. Uh, coal about three, 3.5 cents per kilowatt hour to produce. Um, so if you have the choice, we'll go for the renewables anyway. So it's great because economic interest and ecological um, interest actually go together. It's good. Why don't we usually see this? This is usually because um, renewable energies are in the middle of nowhere, right? Because they need a lot of space. So for solar, you probably want to be in the desert where there's no people. For wind, you want to be in the ocean where there's no people. And um, for um, for hydro, you need to flood a huge valley where there's hopefully no people. So. Um, uh, so in order to actually get the power to your socket, you need to have a lot of uh, transmission. And the transmission is the expensive part, right? Imagine undersea cables, uh, overhead, 1,000 kilovolts, whatever. This is expensive and this is a missing infrastructure right now. We don't have this. That's why if you buy green power, if you buy it from further away, that's why you're paying extra. Not because it's more expensive to generate. And Bitcoin helps with this because um, if you build a solar farm in a Sahara, let's say, um, it produces, um, also, if you sell your project budget to put the Bitcoin mines beside it also, they'll be super profitable because the energy is so cheap, and it'll pay back the whole project faster, which would actually allow you to do faster investments to do more. 
So if you look at it from this side, it's going to actually help um, renewable energy projects which are further out to kind of recoup their invest faster and to scale renewables faster. This is a perspective. And also, if you look at the graph down here, you can see this, this spiky thing. This is the an electricity generation um, on a day and night cycle. I'm not sure where it is. I think it's Germany somewhere. So you can see the yellow, this is solar actually, only coming during the midday, of course, and then falling up again in the evenings. Then we have uh, wind. Where's the wind? The wind coming usually in the mornings and in the evenings, but also not during midday. Um, we also have the base load, so this is like you know, biomass, we've got coal, we've got oil, we've got gas. So this is kind of flexible, it's kind of up and down the gas turbines depending on the renewable energies that are needed. And also we have, um, what's it, pump up, yeah. It's when you pump up water up into the hydro dam, so then later when you need the water, then you can generate the power plants, so we have like a huge batch of things. So this is the blue things here. No, no, sorry, it's, a, it's this um, color thing that's trying to compensate for the solar. So what Bitcoin can do is it can create a huge base load. So it can create a demand of the network, which is very stable. Right? Bitcoin mines always running at 100 percent They just mine. And whenever there's a peak, and um, other people need the energy more than Bitcoin miners do, you just turn off the Bitcoin farm for half an hour. It just costs the cost of Bitcoin miners half an hour, not losing any data or anything, and um, it can stabilize the network. So actually, miners are working um, with everyone. Uh, in, in all the countries, they're working with the network operators to actually help them be a subtractive, flexible baseload. And this is, um, this is a field that's actually growing right now. I think we'll see much more of this in the future. And that's good because if you have a higher baseload, you can have the energy companies um, put up more um, capacities that can require, that can fulfill the baseload, and then we have again economics of scale where you can have more renewables because of the baseload you need now. Okay. I think this is the last slide. I think we made it. So I calculated some numbers a while back and I checked on the internet. CO2 comparison. How much Bitcoin, how much is Bitcoin used compared to other things? Uh, so here, yeah, Bitcoin uses 44 megatons of CO2 per year, right? Ethereum will have a quarter, a quarter of that. And it's which is a proof of stake, let's see. Probably zero. Uh, tumble dryers, those wonderful things that wreck your clothes. They use more than Bitcoin actually, which is interesting. Well, what do you think has more value for humanity? Tumble drives, Bitcoin, and Bitcoin, full disclosure. Um, the banking system, this is a rough estimate, right? But the banking system, they're estimating it to be about 130 megatons. Difficult, because they don't publish numbers like Bitcoin that you can clearly translate between hash rate and power. It's just like, oh, how many servers can we think of the bank uh, Germany, 776 megatons. Uh, air conditioning, <laughs> this is a good one, about 1,000 megatons. I think this is not something that we're aware of so much in Germany, we don't have air conditioning. But I'm actually part of Australia, and uh, air conditioning is a major part of life, really. And it is a lot of power. Uh, this is a major thing. And then the aviation industry, we have planes, 2,000, just to get that in comparison. Three times more than Germany. Actually quite amazing. And I'll make another calculation, which is a bit more, it's a, it's a bit more interesting. So you can think of it this way. Bitcoin, like I said, is about 1.5% uh, transaction fee, right? So 98.5% is new Bitcoins being generated, and 1.5% is the transaction fees. So miners are trying to get the coins, right? So if there was no more coins being generated, only 1.5% of miners would be left. So we can say that 1% of, uh, of Bitcoin mining is actually going into verifying transactions. So and if we take that, then we can get these equivalents here. If we're a bit when there's five transactions a second, which it's doing right now, then every transaction is about as hurtful as a cheeseburger. If we have 14 transactions per second in Bitcoin, then we reach like about one minute of flying a plane. No, sorry. Uh, about 250 transactions a second in Bitcoin. If, if the scales are high, there's so many transactions being used, then everyone's about as painful as one hour of watching TV. And um, the Google search for that mean much more. So people actually use only 0 0.2 grams of CO2 per Google search. At least they say so. So in order to reach that, we need 100,000 transactions per second. And Bitcoin can scale this high easily because of the lightning network. So um, there's a base layer blockchain can move up five transactions a second, but lightning can do an unlimited amount. I think it's just a, a 
just a matter of time until finally Bitcoin will be used by more people, Lightning Network will be integrated more, and um, the relative cost per transaction will then uh, tank because of that. I think that's it. Yes, thank you.